Welcome back to another episode of the Jasmine Star Show. Today, my guest is the one, the only Ed Milet. Ed and I were just talking about the first time we met each other, and I have to say, Ed called me out. Like, mm -hmm. okay, actually, let's just back this up. Let's, okay. We're just going to back this up. Okay. You ask me, I, I'm not going to do the intro to the show because yeah. listen, 20 seconds on Google, people will know you're right. an, a remarkable human being, a yeah. man of integrity, oh, wow. and you, you inspire other people. Okay, thank so you. that's you in a nutshell. Okay, thank but you. we come in and your skill set is the ability to see somebody, mm -hmm. call it the BS, and rewrite the story, which is of my ilk. You are my people. Yeah. Except for the fact I don't like when, uh, when somebody's doing <laughs> it to, to me. Yeah, so it's like you people. come in and you're like, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, oh, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. It's Ed. Yeah. So then like a few minutes later, you're like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, oh, it's great, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And like not even 30 seconds later, you're like, okay, you're evading the question, how's it really going? And yeah. I was like, ooh, I am seen, <laughs> I am known. He saw me, he saw me. And this that. is what you do so, so, so well. Thank and you. I explained that the people who watch the videos and people who just listen to the show, by and large, mm -hmm. people who want to create a business, create mm -hmm. a life they love, and I couldn't think of somebody better to speak about that than you. Well, thank you. You are a phenomenal speaker. You mm -hmm. inspire millions. You have millions of followers on social, a very mm -hmm. powerful YouTube show. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have all the things, and all the makings, but if you don't mind, yeah. could I read something? Sure. Okay. Uh, let's start. Okay. Quote, a dream starts by stirring deep inside you and eventually finds its way to a place where you think about it often. You apply logic and reason as you start to figure out how to make it a reality. You can try to deny your feelings or downplay your dreams, but when you're honest with yourself, you understand that any dream that, ha that you have has been planted by your brain and into your heart for a reason. Too often, we let our previous failures hold us back because we're afraid that the same thing will happen again. And when our memories are good, we tend to settle for living through our past accomplishments instead of continuing to grow and experience life to its fullest. Mm. Don't settle for the past. Don't fall into old patterns. Don't dwell into the past. Instead, dream and go to places your heart wants to take you. That's pretty good. Yeah, you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So tell me, we're here, <laughs> mm. and when you talk about this, mm -hmm. candidly, where you're at right now, what's the dream that has been placed on your heart? Uh, right. My dream's really been clear for a while now. There's some point, like maybe in my mid, well, in my early 40s, I'm like, I just want to help other people. I'm kind of, mm. I was lucky. My first half of my life, I built a pretty good life. I was blessed with lots of mentors, lots of people that helped me, mainly my dad, who I talk about in the book a lot. And it just dawned on me, and that's why I wrote about this in the book, that most people at some point in their life, they start to operate out of their history and their memory. Like mm -hmm. that's their frame. Mm -hmm. And so they keep repeating the same history and the same memories, basically a pattern of the same life. There's just different people with different circumstances, but it's like the same emotions, mm -hmm. the same level of achievement. And so what you have to do is you have to learn how to operate out of your vision and your imagination. That's, that's something that's a skill. So like in the book, I teach it. So mm -hmm. for me, I wanna teach people like the actual stuff I've done to build a pretty decent life for myself. And one of them is not operating out of your history and your memory all the time. And that's something most people do because your mind gravitates towards what it's most familiar with. So if it's mm -hmm. most familiar with your past and your memories, you're gonna keep gravitating back towards that. When you're little, when you were a little girl, or I was a little boy, or anybody here was little, we we're much more easily happy. And mm -hmm. I have two reasons why I think that is. One, we were more recently with God, mm -hmm. so we were just there. And two, we were in our imaginations all the time. We had no history or memories to operate out of. And then as we get older, they'll start stacking up. All this software and limiting beliefs gets installed in us by the people who love us. And we wake up and we just operate out of that frame all the time. Mm -hmm. So for me, I want to help people not do that. I want them to live great lives. And I do have kind of a unique set of experiences. I sound like Liam Neeson when I say that. <laughs> but I have a unique set of skills you do. that I think can help people do that. So that's what I want to do. Mm. Okay, so there's a couple things that came up for me there. Um, your birthday was rather recent, mm. but your mom gave you your dad's cufflinks. Yeah. And when you talk about living in the past, there are mm -hmm. elements mm -hmm. that are that are empowering to us, and yeah. there are elements that are the things that hold us back. Yeah. When you put your dad's cufflinks on, mm -hmm. like what are the stories? How does it empower you, or does it? Well, no, big time. That's such a great question. So my dad's the centerpiece of my life. You right. know this, but right. I talk about it in the book. I was right. raised by an alcoholic. My dad, my first 15 years of my life, lived a not great life. And the reason I believe humans can change so much is I watched my hero do it. My right. dad then for like the 11 millionth time, tried to get sober one more time, mm -hmm. one more try. And there was these themes in his life of one more. So he finally got sober. And it was a very emotional thing I write about in the book. And then when he got sober, I said, Daddy, are you gonna stay sober forever? 
And he said, I don't know, I'm gonna stay sober for one more day at a time. Mm. And I've used that lesson a lot when I wanted to quit businesses. I just like, I'm not gonna quit for one more day. Mm. I'm gonna quit for one more day. And there were all these one mores in my dad's life where he helped one more person get sober. And so, mm. only my dad, by the way, my dad never again celebrated, I'm born April 27th, my dad was born April 11th. And in between those two, my dad got sober. My dad got sober on 420, which is hilarious. So, <laughs> on 420, only my dad would get sober on 420. But the next 35 years, my dad only celebrated that birthday. Mm -hmm. And so when I put those cufflinks on that my mom gave me, it makes me emotional to say, but I kind of step into that person who gives things one more try. Mm. Who I know in your life, the premise of the book's really simple. My dad always told me this. It's not, the Bible says, where there's no vision, the people will perish. Right. But if you dig deeper, most of us have a vision. Like, would we rather be happy or sad? What's your vision? Happy. You want to be rich or poor? You want a jet or commercial, right? You want a beautiful home like this, or you want to live in an apartment the rest of your life? Do you want to help a bunch of people and contribute or make no difference in the world? Right. So most people have a vision. Their issue is depth perception. They think they're further away all the time. Mm. And so because they think it's far away, they act in accordance with that belief system, and they always keep those dreams and visions that far away from them. But what if the truth is you're not that far away? What if the truth is you're one decision away from changing your life like my dad was? What if you're one relationship, one meeting, one podcast, one interview, one book, one thought, one new emotion? What if you were that far away from changing your life? Then life would look a lot different. Then you'd begin to look for those one mores everywhere. Mm. And so when I put those cufflinks on, I have a tendency to look for those one mores more than I do when I don't. Ah, so good. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I love getting practical. Yeah. So somebody's listening yep. and they're like, okay, so Ed says yep. depth perception, yep. the thing I want is farther than what I think is possible, yep. at least in the immediacy. Yep. And so I act in accordance to that, which in perpetuity pushes it farther away. Keeps it there. So then for somebody who's listening, they're like, okay, yep. let me see if this guy is really talking the talk. Yeah. I have a vision for X. Yep. What are the decisions? What am I looking for? When you say one more decision, Great one question. more thing, like where, what, give me the nitty gritty. That's the one thing about this book. If I have a criticism of my own book, it would be that it's heavy. It is loaded with like detailed stuff. So the second chapter of the book is called The Matrix. And I love The Matrix because Neo was the one, which yes. we can talk about. But what The Matrix really means for me is there's a part of your brain, if we're gonna be really detailed, called the reticular activating system. Amen. It's located in the prefrontal cortex of your brain. Yep. It is the filter that reveals the world to you. It, only the things that matter most to you are revealed by this filter. Perfect example is I just bought a Tesla. I like what Musk is doing, right? So I go, I told my team, give me a Tesla. So I get this, I drove it here today. I get a Tesla, all of a sudden, Jess, okay, I'm on, on the road. I, I mean, people are listening right now. I just want to yeah. take a moment. Yeah. So I told my team to get me a Tesla. Oh, so yeah. this right here, yeah. this right here, I want you to know, <laughs> right. this is all of a sudden, I'm like, that's possible? <laughs> so I'm going to behave right. as if I am one day away yeah. from telling my team, and, but, give me the Tesla. And by the way, because <laughs> you believe that, you're much closer. By the way, I've also been in a point in my life where I'm like, I have no team to tell anything to, and my Honda CRX 100%. just had the uh, of, passenger seat stolen out of it, right? So I've been in both yes. places, believe me. And uh, that's probably why it's so clear to me. But all of a sudden, I'm on the road. I see freaking Teslas everywhere now. I mean, like literally everywhere. Yeah. Three lanes over, other side of the freeway. Babe, white Tesla, babe, red Tesla, babe. They're everywhere. They were always there. Mm -hmm. Why do I see them now? I see them now because they've been programmed into my RAS is important to me. So what happens is, in life, if you can begin to make your ambitions, your goals, your visions, those decisions, those relationships, your Teslas, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're revealing. They've always been there. This is the thing people don't understand, the law of attraction, blah, blah, blah. These things have always been there, but you're not hearing them. You're not seeing them. You're not feeling them because your RAS is programmed to worry about the things you're stressed about, your current problem in front of you, the immediate thing you have to do. Yeah. So how do you do it? You have to do it by repeated repeated clear visualizations because your mind moves towards what it's most familiar with you're already humans are already great at this they just visualize the stuff they're worried about they just visualize the tasks they have to do they don't take control of their imagination and their ras and i teach you in the book how to slow visualizations down how to do them it's not complicated you can do it in three or four minutes and it becomes repetitive it becomes a muscle it's why, like, when you walk in a room, there could be 300 people in a room. If someone says quietly the name Jasmine, you hear it auditorily right. over all the other voices. Right. Everybody's this way because it's in your RAS. So these things have always been there. And in the matrix, they slow it down. What happens when you start to program your matrix is your life begins to slow down and you start to see these things. I just played golf. This is crazy. About the guy about three weeks ago, they go, hey, I want you to meet this dude. Your net worths are similar. So I get on the first tee and the guy's like, oh man, I'm a fan of yours. I can't wait to hear about you. I go, that's not how I work, bro. 
I already know about me. We're going to talk about you today, mm. right? I'm not talking about me. And so I go, tell me your story. He took about one decision away. This blew my mind. He goes, well, my story's really quick. He goes, 1986, I loaned a guy $50,000. And he goes, my best friend loaned the same guy 50 grand. A week later, my best friend said, please give me the money back. The guy returned the money. I let the loan go. It turned into 750 million bucks. <laughs> I said, dude, stop. Who'd you loan that money to? Jeff Bezos. Wow. I went, you got to be freaking kidding me. And I said, wait a minute, you really were one decision, one relationship, one loan right. away from totally changing your life. Now that's extreme. I don't right. have that story. Right. But I'm a series of small one mm. mores over my life that have transformed me to the point where I'm addicted to it now. Mm. And, and here's the hook, and then I'll come up for air. Most of these things are painful. Oof. And on the other side of pain, Napoleon Hill says, you get introduced to your other self. If you can survive mm. the temporary. This is even good for you right now as mm -hmm. you're building your business and you're doing so great, right? Can you survive the temporary? Most people make permanent decisions on temporary conditions, especially Ooh. entrepreneurs. They do it all the time. And the truth is if you can survive the temporary and get to the other side of it, there's a gift revealed to you. I'll give you the big one. You opened the interview by saying to me that one of my gifts, and I only have two or three. I've made hundreds of millions of dollars with very limited skills. It's just the truth. But I do have two or three. So does everybody that are unique mm -hmm. to them. One of them is what you said, I am good at reading people and mm. being present and listening closely. What's that come from? Let me tell you what it comes from. I'm the child of an alcoholic. Mm. And so when I was five years old, yeah. I had three sisters and a mom. I had to know what dad was coming through that front door at five. Right. And so that man would come through that front door and this little boy, me, I'd have to read my daddy. Is this drunk dad? Is his tie a little loose? Is his hair messed up? Is mm -hmm. he walking a certain way? Is he a little slower? And if it's drunk, Dad, i got to get my sisters upstairs. I'm going to tell my mom to go take a shower. And then I'm going to grab my dad's hand at five. And I'm going to do the other thing I'm good at. I'm going to talk to him. Mm. And I'm going to change his state. I'm going to tell him how good I did at school that day. And I'm going to move him around. And I'm going to talk to him. If it was sober, Dad, we'd just go play baseball in the backyard and have a great time. But I learned to read people because of a tragedy in my life. Mm. A tragedy. One of the hardest, painful things of my life gave me one of the greatest skills I have that's made me tons of money and helped mm. millions of people. So most of these things that you want in your life are hidden behind temporary pain. Oh, okay. So for the perpetual cynic and mm -hmm. skeptic and the people who I love, I love yeah. those who challenge. So do I. Somebody's listening and they say, it is a skill that Ed Milet has honed, mm -hmm. drilled in, that now he sees one more, one more, one more. Mm -hmm. It is the white Tesla. Mm -hmm. But go back to the Ed when you were living a much simpler life, when somebody did steal the passenger's yeah. seat out of your Honda Civic. Yeah. Can you give us an example of one more thing that you did that like all of a sudden it started opening your eyes to what was uh, that potential? Yeah, we had the, uh, I got so broke, so our, um, I was doing okay. A lot of entrepreneurs, I was doing all right, and then like things went bad. That's entrepreneurship, right? You take off, then you crash. You take can off, you talk, then you crash. Can you talk about that, that just got the nutshell version of you were doing okay. What, what business was this? Like I had, I had a real estate business <laughs> and a financial business. And so, you know, I had done well, and then the market crashed, and then I had a foreclosure. And then I came out one morning, and Christiana's car was stolen. I'm like, I can't take this anymore. Except when I got back into the apartment, turns out it wasn't stolen, it was repoed, right? <laughs> and then we had our power turned off. And then that's bad, but then the worst is we had the water turned off. Mm. And so she had to go get a job while I was an entrepreneur. And the water turned off, you can't cook, you can't bathe. I would have to get up every morning with my new bride, walk down our apartment stairs after we had already owned a house that we lost, hold a towel up and we would go to the pool at the apartment complex, there was a shower there, outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I'd hold a towel up while my new wife would take a shower and brush her teeth. And then we would switch. I get emotional today about it. And I would hold the towel up. She would hold it up for me. And I remember we would just climb back up those stairs and I'd have to, I'm living a nightmare. And I gotta go out into the world and sell a dream. And mm -hmm. I decided to go get a job. Hold on. Yeah. I was living a nightmare and mm -hmm. I had to go and sell a dream. Yeah. Oh! If, that it, ain't not, if that's not the entrepreneur struggle. It is the entrepreneur yeah. struggle. And I still sold the dream. Mm -hmm. I operated out of my vision and my imagination, right. not my memory and my history. Mm. And so this is so critical. But here's what happened. It's crazy. Here's one more decision I made. I actually went to surrender. I was going to quit. My brother-in-law, who worked for LA Cellular at the time, was doing really well. He was making like 200 grand a year. And what was he doing for LA Cellular? Sales, sales okay. manager. Okay. And so long story short, I'll make it really quick. He was out on Victoria Beach with my sister visiting. 
So I met him down there. I said, hey, can we take a walk? And my intention on that walk when I took him was to quit and to ask him for this job. Okay. And I was so down. And uh, we had no water. They don't know this, but like, I'm, I mean, I'm worried about eating. And uh, I haven't told this ever. I don't know why I'm doing this today. We're walking, because it's you. We're walking, <laughs> we get like about 50 yards. He's like, so what, bro? And I go to say, can you give me a job? I go to say that, except I, in the, I go, how long are you gonna stay at that crappy job, bro? He goes, what? I go, you need to come into business with me. You need to come live the dream, dude. I'm gonna build something big. I've got these plans. Here's what I'm gonna do. This, 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 and this, and it's gonna be amazing. I'm gonna be worth millions of dollars. I'm gonna live on this beach someday, bro. You gotta come do this with me. And as I'm saying, I'm like, what? Like, I had intended, <laughs> but I couldn't quit. And somehow that imagination came out of me. I swear to you, Jasmine, he goes, I don't know, bro. I need to think about it. I go, you need to think about it. I'll give you a day. He quit that job two days later and mm -hmm. came to work with me. He still works on that financial company to this day. He's made millions of dollars. I've made millions of dollars. That one moment of decision walking that beach with him, Ooh. and he'll hear this. We haven't talked about this in years, altered my life, altered his life. And I was just ready to go. I'm out. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was literally on the walk to raise my hands. And something in me said one more time, and everything shifted there. Ooh, Isn't that crazy? Ed is coming in hot. Yeah, okay. I've never said that anywhere. Okay, okay. Yeah. So actually, this leads me to another thing that you wrote, but yeah. I actually think it's running in parallel because you talk about your brother-in-law and you talk about your wife. Yeah. You referred to your bride. Quote: Do you have it in you to be the one in your family, mm -hmm. the one who changes the way your family thinks and lives forever, the one who changes the emotions and status and opinions your family has had forever? The one your family will remember long after you're gone. The one who gets family respect. The one who keeps them safe. Are you the one who's going to dig deeper, take the extra time, and work harder than your parents, sibling, children, cousins, in-laws, or anyone else around you? Mm -hmm. Will you be the one to develop the talents, gifts, and abilities for the greater good of the people you care about the most? When you become the one that your family members look to, you become the protector, a source of hope and inspiration, and an example of how they can lead better lives. Yeah, I love that. So Neo is the one, by the way, in the Matrix. And in every family, me and Christiana would walk on that same Victoria Beach when we were little kids. We lived up in Diamond Bar, nowhere near the beach. That same beach I walked down with my brother-in-law, we would walk as kids and I'd go, babe, I'm gonna get us one of these beach houses one day. Because we were dating in high school. I had no freaking clue how. And the truth is, I would go home to my dad, I'd go, dad, who are these people? Who lives mm. like, of all the houses in the world, at the end of where there's no more land, these people look at an ocean. Who the heck are you? Because my dad goes, I don't know who these people are. And what I figured out as I got older is, when you see a happy family, or a rich family, or one that's both, if you go all the way back in their lineage, at some point, they weren't. Mm. They weren't. And then the one shows up. Mm -hmm. The one steps forward in that family and changes everything. They fight for the family, they improve themselves, they take all the hits, they take all the arrows, they get up off the canvas, and that one person changed that family forever. That one person, in my family, I'm the one. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that went out, I changed the way we live, the way the world treats us, how we think. My little nephews and nieces, right. they don't think like I thought as a kid, they think bigger, they mm -hmm. think differently, they think about giving, they think about contributing. And here's the irony of it, I live on that beach now. Mm. I live, that place you came to that I interviewed, I sold that, I live on that exact beach that I used to take my girlfriend to, that exact beach I walked on with my brother-in-law to, to quit my business and go to work with him. I literally live on that exact beach now. And the truth, and that's one of the places we live, and the truth is, it's because I'm the one in my family. Every one of you listening to this, you're the one in your family. Mm. And the fact that you doubt it, and you wonder whether it's you, but you so badly want it to be you, mm. means it's you. It means it's you. I doubted it. But I wanted to be. I wanted my family to be proud of me. I wanted to do something great with my life. The premise of this book is really simple. You were born to do something great with your life, and it's high time you get around to doing it, and you need the tools. It's not just, I love Think and Grow Rich. Other than the Bible, it's my favorite book. But you don't just think and get rich. Right. You can't just sit around and think. You gotta do stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I'll, and every book I write on, read on personal development, I love them, but there's some derivative of that. Right. So I wanted to, I don't want that. I want to know what do I need to think and then what do I need to do, do. in congruency to change something. Amen. And that's what we do. Amen. Okay, so um, we're here. 
and y you feel like, sir, you bring that energy with some like big white tent down mm. in the south, you're preaching. <laughs> I'm like, I, I am ready. Hallelujah. So then there's people who are listening to be like, I, uh, I am the one. Mm -hmm. I am the one. I love it. And I start to behave in such a way. Mm -hmm. And immediately there are other people in their family who might not say, but are actually saying, why are you acting like that? Yeah, you got it. Who are you? Who are you? I had it. Okay, yeah. tell me there. What happens there? What are the conversations? Who do you have to become? What do you have to say? Yeah, well, first off, most of them love you. They're actually truly worried about you. Yeah. It's not hate. Like, you have to distinguish between who's antagonistic towards you and who just cares because you're, like my dad was like, why are you doing this? Like, you're going through hell here. I love you. They don't want to see you in pain, right. right? But here's what happens in life, and this is what you just need to realize. Small people, and I don't mean bad people. I mean people with small lives and small thoughts project their limited beliefs onto you all the time. So when it's happening, realize they're just dumping their own limitations onto you That's when right. they do it. And you identify what it is. That's I actually right. got to the point where it did, it did hurt me, like when it was my parents at first. And then I realized... But what would they, what would, what would they say? Or was well, it like you, a feeling? You know, like you have a college degree. Why are you doing... Oh. Why don't you go get a decent job? Mm. What, 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 when is enough enough for you, right? Why is money so important to you? And I used to say to them, I go, it's not the money part. It's who I want to become. It's what I want to do. It's, I said, Dad, there's an expression of me I want to have in my life. I want to express my life differently than you did. And I don't mean that in a negative way. And by the way, years later, as my dad was dying, he was so proud of me and, and would tell me of some of his regrets where he didn't go for it, where he didn't take risks. But so what I would say to you when you're getting those is realize they're projecting their limiting beliefs onto you. And here's the thing. I'm just going to be real with you. You can't take some heat from your own family, but you think you're gonna go make hundreds of millions of dollars with Ooh. all the crap that comes in the business world? <laughs> the worst rejection wasn't my mama. Right. It was walking into a meeting, the guy goes, this sucks, no, get out of here. Or I'm halfway through a presentation. I had a guy do this to me time. <laughs> like out loud, in the middle of <laughs> No. He literally made a sound effect, like a honk. <laughs> Okay, so you think I'm worried about my mom or my sister okay, says? Well, come on. Come so, on. so this person's like, Arr. literally, and I'm like, this is gonna be unbelievable. He's like, Arr. you're done. And like, what did you do? I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry. What? He goes, Arr. you're done. <laughs> I mean, it was just stunning to me. I'm like, what? are you okay? Like, I'm not done. Actually, I'm just in the very beginning. No, no, trust me, you're done. We're not doing this, right? Now, here's what's really cool. 20 years later, I'm worth 300 times what that guy's worth, right? Exactly. And the fact that he treats human beings that way means right. he's a miserable existence as a human. Right. I would never speak to a human being that way, right? But so what I'm saying to you is, look, it, grow up. I'm going to be really frank with you. Your mommy and daddy and sister, your grandma's not excited about what you're doing, but you still, but if they were excited for you, then you could make hundreds of millions of dollars. Who the heck are we kidding here? That's right. The real rejection is when they say no. The real rejection is when your water gets turned off. That's the right. real rejection is when you're, you're going to the ATM and going, please let there be 20 bucks in there because they only spit out 20s, right? That's the real hard stuff. It's when a bill collector's calling you, right? Mm. It's when you got a big order and you can't get the inventory to scale it. Mm. These are big problems in life. Your mommy or your sister. Mm. So like, let's, let's elevate our thinking here. Let's grow up. Let's be big. Win in spite of it. And here's the other thing. People say, well, it's my spouse. Oh. My spouse isn't motivated like me. And I'm like, well, I'm married to a wonderful woman. She doesn't have external drive for like achievement or wealth right. or any of that. She's very easily happy, right? She just, she loves her life. And people have said, what would it have been like if you were married to this like dynamically other powerhouse woman? I'm like, well, I have enough for both of us on that. Mm. And by the way, she has enough caring and nurturing for both of us. And mm. she, has the, she has the ability to be present with people that sometimes I don't have or whatever it might mm. be, right? So, so the, you, you lack enough motivation that you need someone else's? Okay. Like, let's go. Like, if you're gonna, this is big stake stuff. You wanna get to the top in something? Do you think Tom Brady shows up to a football game on the sixth week and goes, man, if, if Dijelle was just more motivated about this game, I'd play better. You know, right. come on, like, let's get, let's get over it. Let's, let's start thinking about the big things in life. And here's the other thing. It all disappears when you win. Once you win, it's all gone. They always believed in you. They want to use your beach house. They want to fly on your jet. <laughs> They're so proud of you. They always knew you could do it. Mm. You know, it's just the way it goes. I have this uncle who every year, I won't say who he is, every year holidays. Are you a millionaire yet? Are you a millionaire yet? Just to shame, shame me, right? I'm like, no, I'm not a millionaire, uncle. No, I'm not. And then one year I showed up, I'm like, I can't wait for this mf -er to ask me, <laughs> right? Grown 45-year-old man, show up at Thanksgiving. So, I know it was coming halfway through. So, are we a millionaire yet? I'm like, matter of fact, we are. Matter of fact, we're a multi-millionaire. But I've been wanting to ask you for like six years, are you? Dead silence at the table. D just drops his head at the table.
right? He's just projecting his limiting stuff on me. By the way, I love him. It's just, you know. I mean, but the quite real question is, did you for Christmas get him a crocheted sweater of that. the Ed Milet Santa? Because I, I mean, for those of you who don't know, y'all have to follow oh. Ed Milet on yeah. social media. Yeah. I think your family is hilarious. Thank you. And I love that you host family get-togethers, like you celebrate yeah. your nieces and nephews yeah. in your home. All the time. And when you talk about being the one person, um, I can testify that when you say your nieces and nephews have changed because mm. of the decisions that you have made, mm. you're showing them what is possible. Yeah. And so. Likewise, when yeah. everybody has the jokes around Christmas and there's like an Ed Milet <laughs> Christmas tacky Christmas sweater. Them. That's right. Yeah, they do. That's they right. Give us one to your uncle. <laughs> Frame it. Here you go, uncle. Here I wish everybody go. could see that because these sweaters are goofy. One thing, too, about this thing in life, if you're a parent or even a business leader, most of the most important stuff is caught, not taught. It's caught. Mm. They see it. They're around it. It's, the, it's You can't just sit with someone and teach them a lesson. They catch things from being in your presence as a parent or as a business leader, it's caught. Okay, yeah. I wasn't gonna bring this up, but yeah. is it okay? Give me, give me like two minutes. Okay. So a couple years ago, you and I meet, I'm mm -hmm. a guest on your podcast, and we yep. stay in touch just loosely, very yep. loosely. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking at an event in San Diego. This is so awesome. And then this. you text me and said, hey, my son wants to go to the event. Mm -hmm. Do you think, like, how, you think, like, if you see him there, can you make him comfortable? I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. I was like, Ed, let me get him a ticket. You did. Thinking, wait, 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 yeah. here's the backstory, Ed. Yeah. I was like, I'll get him a ticket, thinking I can go to the event organizers and be like, hey, can I get a ticket? To which I was like, sure, you can, but it's not gonna be for free. And so then I was just like, I, know I, I know you don't know the story because I didn't tell you. I was like, I'm not gonna go back to Ed Milet and be like, hey, can you get me down for the money for the event? That's weird. And I was like, I'm a woman of integrity. If I say I'm gonna get Max a ticket, I'm gonna get Max a ticket. So I buy him a ticket, Jasmine. but wait a minute, this is not about me. This is when you say it is caught, not taught. Mm. There was a line of people at the end of the event and there was a person who waited in the line mm -hmm. and Max came up to me mm -hmm. and he said, Miss Star, mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me at this oh. event. Get out of mm -hmm. here. Well, I didn't you know you raised, did that. Thank you. Well, well, no, no, no. I'm sorry. It's not the story to be like, so I bought Max a ticket. No, no but it was, I can't tell you mm -hmm. that, that who he showed up as a young man, he was, mm -hmm. um, 18, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. An 18 year old boy. Yeah, I think it was even seven, 16 or 17. Years. Exactly. Yeah. Who has his own drive, his mm -hmm. own hutzpah, is carving out his own path. He's not yeah. depending on things from his parents. Oh. He waits in line. Thank you for telling me that. To, and I think to myself, you bought if my this son a is, ticket to that event. Well, Jasmine. but, but, but no, that. no, Ed, no, you're missing the point, Ed. No, that's the, one point of the point is you, you create children mm -hmm. who model who you are. You do. Yeah. And I am just so impressed with you. your wife, with Thank Christiana you. and you. Thank you. And I, as a parent now, I'm like, I hope that my daughter would stand in the line and say thank you for something that somebody had did for them. Your daughter gets to model you? Are you kidding me? That's oh, Lord. remarkable. No. Oh, Lord. <laughs> it's so awesome. It's so awesome. You know, um, one other thing I will tell you, but I said when he got back, and I'm not just saying this, I want to tell you this straight up. I said, who's the best speaker? He goes, Dad, it was not remotely close. Like, Aww. she stole the show. But he has referenced your talk. Mm -hmm. He's going to watch this, so, you know, I, I'm not allowed to not say something. Straight. I bet you that Max has referenced that talk you gave probably 50 times mm -hmm. in the last several years. So, I mean, like, you made a huge impact on my son. Just because you're so good. He said it was not even close. Like, it was a dumb question when I asked him who was the best speaker there, because it was you. Thank you for doing well, that. Well, tell him I said hi. I will. Well, I wish I'm him the best. I know he's, like, kicking butt playing golf in college. I will. Okay. Tell so, bringing us back. Yeah. If we're depending on the accolades of people who are close to us, and we mm -hmm. say if they supported us, yep. then we would be able to do those things. Mm -hmm. And so, all of a sudden, we have this, like, reconciliation, this cognizance that the, the people who love us are trying to protect us. And mm -hmm. if we can't show up for them and beyond them, there's no way we'd make it in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so, somebody says, I've gone to that point. I am there. I am ready. Uh, the uh, And get, life is giving me the uh. Yeah. What is a singular transformative thought? that somebody could think okay. that would change that? Because I know you discuss it in the book, and so mm -hmm. I really want to drill down on that. What is one thought, one thing that we could think, like, I'm stuck, how do I get out? Yeah, you have to evaluate the meaning you take from things. So it's not the mm -hmm. events of your life. First off, what's thinking? Like, let's just look at that. Oof. What's thinking? Thinking is the process of asking and answering questions to ourselves. I get really deep on that in the book. So thoughts are created by questions. So you have a repeated question that you ask yourself regularly. So. Two things you need to do is you need to change the question you ask yourself, not the statement you make to yourself, but the question you ask yourself. And I'll give you a thought about that. I literally list like 50 questions to ask yourself. But the other thing is that it's not the, the events of our life that define us. It's the meaning we take from it. That meaning then creates an emotion. That emotion causes us to take a, make mm. a decision, okay? So mm -hmm. for example, you and I, God forbid, worst thing ever, we walked out to the house when I leave here and there was a car accident and someone was killed right here, and we had to walk to the scene of that accident. So that's an event. You and I would go to that event and go, my gosh, this is a 
the, one of the worst tragedies, the worst tragedy I've ever experienced in my life. We'd be sad, we'd create a series of emotions. Same exact event, Mother Teresa was here. She would tell you that it was the honor of her lifetime to be present when someone's soul leaves their body and goes to heaven. Same exact event, mm. totally different meaning, totally different emotion. That's an extreme example. So what you have to start asking yourself is when something happens, this may seem weird, what would I need to believe about this so that it would serve me? My dad's drinking. Mm. I could be the son of an alcoholic and I could have all those negatives in there and that's where I come from and my dad was this, my dad was that. Or I could say, what do I need to mean? What do I need to believe about that event? Well, what I need to believe, which is true, is that's where I got my best skill sets. Mm. What I did is I learned about redemption. What I learned is what I didn't want to have. So it's asking yourself the powerful question, what would I need to be? Here's the other thing. When you have a negative thought, awareness of a thought makes it lose its power over you. So for me, I have those thoughts sometimes too. And I'll go, I'm doing it again. Mm. And then you get above your thought. When you get above your thought, it's almost like a little game you're watching play. It can't impact you like it does when you're in the thought. So get above your thought. You don't have to believe everything you think. Mm. And Amen. most of the stuff you think is bullshit most of the time installed out of a flawed question you keep asking yourself. So just ask yourself, what would I need to believe about this so that it would serve me? And, when you, and then sometimes you can ask yourself, what would so-and-so do in this situation? Use one of your models. How would Jasmine handle this situation? Mm. I do that often. How would one of my mentors handle this situation? So it's ask a better question. You'll get a better answer. You'll take away a better meaning. Uh, I love this. So again, let's get super granular. Yeah. What is a common question that you see people asking and be like, there's a better question. What is the common question? What is the better question? Yeah, one of the common questions is, um, one of the things, what do I need to worry about right now? Well, we all have a question going on in our mind all the time. So like when you wake up in the morning, there's a question you've asked yourself upon waking that creates an emotion for you. For many people, before they even leave the bed, what do I need to worry about today? Ooh. And by the way, here's another one. Here's a big Ooh. one, even though we don't say it that way. Like, what am I afraid of right now? My dad, till he died, when I would get off the phone with him, go, hey, be careful. Oh. I don't even know what it meant. You ever have a parent say that to you? Hey, be careful. I'm like, I'm 46 <laughs> years old. Like, be careful. Do you even know? He didn't even know he was saying it, mm -hmm. right? But what does that notate when you say that to a child all of their life? Be careful. What? Oh, uh, what should I be afraid of? And I want to be a good boy and I want to behave. And I want to so all of these little things that happen. There's these, un, these really quiet questions you're asking yourself all the time. For me, I learned one thing about me. Of all these tools I have, it was like about five years ago. I was like, you know what's interesting, man? I create chaos in my life. Like I stir things up oh. even when they're going good. And, oh. I, and, I, and I'm like, and I used to tell people, I, I function so well in chaos. Cause I do, and I'm really familiar with it. But the reason I create chaos is I grew up in it, mm -hmm. right? So I, no matter what's going on in my life, I find a way to get my chaos. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna find a way to get my chaos. We all in the book, I talk about emotions. We all have like the five or six emotions we get on a weekly basis, regardless of the circumstances. So if those emotions are fear, worry, anxiety, lack, depression, anger, down, whatever they might be, you find a way to get them, don't you? Mm. You find a way to get these emotions, no matter what the conditions are. Maybe a day or two you don't, That's but right. over a week you're like, I got my anxiety, yep. I got my fear, I got my worry, mm. I got my lack. Or you could say the emotions I want are joy, ecstasy, passion, right? For me, I got all the ones I want, but there was this lingering one, which was chaos. Mm. And how do I get rid of it? It's really hard, it still comes up. But what I do is I go, I'm doing it again. I'm doing the chaos thing. I'm doing it, you dummy. I'm doing it and I get above the thought. It almost becomes like watching a little carnival ride down here that I'm doing. I'm like, you dumbass. what are you doing again? Chaos again. What would I need to believe about this so it wasn't chaotic? And what I've would trained I myself to do it. To believe about this. What do I need to believe about so it? What's the meaning I gotta take? Chaotic. Yeah, and I'm like, like I've, got, I've got happiness and joy and ecstasy and passion and all that other stuff. But there's this one dude, I used to have fear and worry and anxiety. You know, I probably still have a little, little worry thing where I'm like, what am I worried about right now? Oh. You ever just, you ever drive in your car, you're doing something, you're like, I don't even know what I'm worried about right now. Yes. You ever have that happen? I sometimes think my mind maps to, what do I need to worry about right now? That's exactly what it's doing, Jasmine. What? It's it, literally it, looking for something to worry it is, about. It is your RAS and it is your map. It is a pattern. The perfect word for it is map. So it's being aware of it when it happens and then beginning to be intentional and replacing it with the other thing. It's exactly what's happening. Ooh. And it's me too. If human beings have this, and here's the other thing, it's never gone if that software was installed in you when you were a child. And by the way, you could say, no, 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 my parents have one of the most loving, unbelievable mm -hmm. people in the world. It's just, my dad, was a, my dad meant to protect me by going, hey, be careful, mm -hmm. be careful. 
What a weird thing to go out into the world thinking about. I better be careful. I better be careful. I better be careful. That's not a way to live your life. Right. Underneath that is fear. And let me say one last thing. No, I say in the book, emotions aren't negative or positive. Right. All of they just are. It's the dosage. Like if I never had fear, right. fear makes you focus. Right. Fear was given to us in the caveman days, so like T-Rex didn't eat us, right? So like fear's healthy in doses. But to live in it, right. it's concerning. I, anxiety's not that bad for me, a little bit of it, because right. it makes me prepare. Right. Right? If you had no right. anxiety about this conversation, perhaps you wouldn't have prepared. Right. So it's the dosage of it. Just realize that. Don't beat yourself up when you have them. It's to the extent that you get it. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Like right now, I mean, people could have stopped listening at mm -hmm. like five minutes in oh, and got, it got a good dose Thank of Ed Milet. Thank you. Um, one last thing. Okay. When you master feeding yourself positive messages, I'm sorry, this is a quote. Yeah. Anybody listen on the podcast, I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Like this, this goodness is not coming from me, uh -huh. okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. When you master feeding yourself positive messages, associating with people who energize you and learning to say no without guilt, you will be happier. Yeah. Your happiness will be a decision you make instead of letting others make it for you. Mm -hmm. The best part about this is that you will learn to be happy even when times are tough and you'll develop a much deeper sense of gratitude. You will. Well, who you're around, and listen, we're really hard on ourselves, humans. Yes, we are. And especially entrepreneurs, but humans in general. And there's an epidemic, pandemic, in the world of not really believing we're worth much. Ooh. There just is. And a lot of people feel invisible. You know, not everyone, when they walk in a room, is like, whoa, you're this, or you're that. Mm -hmm. or, and I want to point something out to everybody that occurred to me after I wrote this book. My dad's single decision to get sober and to stick with it is why I'm with you. That one decision changed our family forever. And I wrote the book and about two weeks ago, Jasmine, I want everyone to hear this, like get nothing out of the podcast and remember this. I woke up at like three o'clock in the morning crying. I'm 51 years old, I was 50 at the time. And um, I've already written the book, so I'm done. And I go, Christiana, I go, wake up. She goes, what? I go. Someone helped my dad. Mm. She goes, what, honey? I said, somebody helped daddy. She goes, what do you mean? I said, someone helped my dad get sober. I don't know who they are. Mm. They changed our family forever. She goes, oh my gosh, I never thought about it. I said, here's what's crazy. Mm. Do you know what qualified them to help my dad? How messed up they were. They were a drunk and an alcoholic. Their mess is what qualified them to help dad. I think every human being needs to understand this. Your mess, the things you're most ashamed of, the things you're most embarrassed about, you in particular are qualified to help people based on your gifts and your experience. This messed up person who was also a drunk and an alcoholic, that very thing they were ashamed of mm. is what qualified <clears throat> them to change my family forever. They didn't know that night, whatever they did to help my dad. Right. They had no, no idea mm. that that one thing they did was gonna cause that man to stay sober, to raise a son who's reached millions, millions. of people. Oof. And it was because they were a simple, normal person with problems that helped another person. And that's what being alive is about. Mm -hmm. It's not being extraordinary. It's not being perfect. It's not not having flaws. It's not having every answer. It's not having the best of everything. It's having the intention. I write a book in the book about, a lot about intention. It's having the intention to make a difference for other people. And knowing that God does not <laughs> call qualified people. He qualifies called people. And that person was called to help my dad. And they were qualified based on their mess. That's insane to me. And so if that person can change millions of people's lives, so can you. Mm. And that person changed millions of people's lives. And there's people who are listening to this now mm -hmm. whose children will be taking the byproduct yeah. of you and I having a conversation. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. And yeah. I just have to say thank you. I think you're awesome. Ed, I just adore you. <laughs> it's I just, you, know that. you come in and it's just like everything divinely aligned mm -hmm. so that this podcast is intended for people. But mm -hmm. what it really was, it was a time of reckoning. Oh. We had a moment of reckoning before mm -hmm. this podcast even started. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to look mm -hmm. back at this time and be like, dang girl, yeah. that was the day. This yeah. is your day. Yeah. This is your day one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. talk to me. I just want you to know you're one of the most special people I've ever met. 
and I've been doing this a long time, I told you that off camera, I think there's something magic about you. That's the right word for it too. There's some magic in you. You're just this package of all of these beautiful gifts all in one person. And she has such a heart, like that story you say about my son makes me emotional, but she has such a heart to uh, serve people and make their lives better. You're such a kind person. You're, you're so beautifully talented too. So I just think you're magic. So thank you for having me. I receive that and I believe that I can receive that compliment because of people like you who have poured into me at different parts of my journey. So I wanna say thank you and I know that you're doing the same for so many people listening. Um, the book, yep. The Power of One More, mm -hmm. where do people go? They yeah. have to go right now. Like yeah, Get it anywhere, get it anywhere books are sold. Um, you can, there's also a website called thepowerofonemore.com where there's like extra tools yes. that you can use with the book. But just go to Amazon, Target, a bookstore, wherever you wanna get it, get The That's Power right. of One More. It'll help you, it's a really good book. And so you buy, in good faith, you buy one for yourself and you, you buy it for the person you, that you're going to give it to. I guarantee you, you're going to want to do that. You will have never read a book like this. I can say that to you with all the confidence in the world. It'll help you. As an avid reader, I would have to agree. Thank Ed you. Ed thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, you. Jasmine. It was awesome.